Hi, um, my name is Alexandra Wanchiku Kelbert, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, Black British feminisms. And some of what I'll be talking about is actually from a research project um, that I've been working on with uh, Mumbi and Conde, um, with some money we received from the Feminist Review Trust. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be giving you a little bit of context. Um, so hopefully you have watched or you will watch some of the videos um, in the rest of the series, including um, I think John Narayan's um, uh, lecture is really useful in contextualizing some of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and then I'm going to go more specifically into um, Black British feminist thought um, and then looking at Black British feminism in action. Um, and from there, I'll try and talk a little bit about the kind of um, hidden histories within this kind of side of history that is already um, quite marginalized. Um, so I'm going to start in the 1950s and I'm going to go over this fairly quickly. Um, but in the resource list, you'll have access to loads of reading if you really want to go into it um, in more details. So I think for us, the, the starting point is the 1950s and looking at the context in which um, women of colour arrived um, in, in Britain. And so, of course, the context for this um, is something that's been explored in, in, in other lectures, so it's the idea of um, the British government um, and its drive to recruit cheap labour from its independent colonies um, in, in the 50s. Um, but I think what's really crucial about this is that um, this context was obviously a political context, but it also means that when, um, for example, black women arrived from the Caribbean, um, they arrived into a labor market that was already gendered um, and that was racialized. Um, and Heidi Mirza has a, um, a really great quote where she says, um, it was simply assumed that migrant workers, like their own workers, like British workers, um, are always male. Um, because of course, um, migrant women arrived in the context where um, there were struggles around um, women's place in, in the labor market. So I think that's really important to keep in mind um, and the way in which we um, gender migration in particular kind of ways and invisibilize particular forms of migration. Um, so the idea that, um, for example, black women from the Caribbean were arriving um, as dependents, as wives or as children. Um, and similarly, um, women from the um, Indian subcontinent also arriving um, as, as wives, um, as, as dependents. Um, and so what you have is um, also a sort of segregation in terms of where women were working. So you had Asian women working primarily in the kind of private sector, in factory and production. Um, and you had Caribbean and African women primarily in public service, caring industries. Of course, now we're talking a lot about um, the role of that um, black um, female labor in the NHS, for example. Um, and I'm not going to go into much detail about this, and you can pause the video and have a look at this um, timeline. But I think generally speaking, what we're looking at is the kind of um, the evolution of um, racism and anti-racism, especially in, in policy um, in Britain from the 1950s through to the kind of mid to late um, 1970s. And what we have is um, this sort of weird dance um, where on the one hand you have explicitly um, racist, um, racist policies um, that are trying to prevent um, coloured um, immigration from from coming in. Um, so you have a tightening of border controls, a tightening of the kind of bordering regimes. Um, you have the creation of the National Front um, with very little resistance from the kind of um, official narrative. Um, but at the same time, you also have um, the Race Relations Act that um, come in place from um, particularly from the 60s, are trying to challenge um, specific forms of discrimination in housing, um, in, in work, um, etc. Um, and so I think this, this paradox between, on the one hand, um, this kind of pro-integration um, and anti-discrimination framework, um, whilst at the same time um, having like racist distinctions really at the core of immigration policies and at the core of the structuring of British society, um, and so that, of course, is the context for um, for black British feminists. Um, and so in the 1970s, um, you have a sort of shift in the modes of resistance. And I think, again, some of that has been explored, um, I think, really well by John 
um, John Lorenz Etcher. Um, and of course, resistance doesn't begin um, in the 70s already. Um, resistance is, you know, there, there is always um, resistance. And if you look at different modes and the evolution of these modes of resistance, um, you see that in the 50s in particular, you have um, specific kind of organic responses with people creating their own churches, their own welfare organizations. Um, and you have forms of resistance that are more spontaneous. In the 60s, you start to see alliances and more organizations. Um, and in, in the 70s, you have quite, um, quite an active um, context. You have a lot of different um, groups. You have um, a lot of different organizations, including, of course, the British Black Panther movement um, and, the, and the Black Power movement more generally. Um, and so what I'm going to be focusing on specifically is what's happening in terms of um, Black women and women of color um, in in this um, context. So the other side of the context is, of course, um, the women's liberation movement. So in the 70s, um, the, the women's liberation movement um, is, is, is really strong um, in, in Britain. And with it comes this vision of um, universal sisterhood. So we're really talking about um, women's experiences. So women's experiences in the home, women's experiences um, in the labor market, um, as wives, as mothers, as um, individuals, etc. Um, but in that kind of vision of um, universal um, womanhood and universal sisterhood, there is very little problematization, problematization of um, racial power within the specific um, feminist production of knowledge. Um, and Catherine Hall is someone who's done a lot of work um, around that and looking at um, this kind of feminist production of knowledge um, and, and many others have been able to like really ask the question of um, where um, like where other forms of um, womanhood fit um, fit within that. And so what black feminism does and, and black feminist thought um, in, in Britain does is it draws attention to the ways in which racialized, gendered and classed structures and discourses um, interact to position women differently in relation to um, to white supremacists and to patriarchal systems of oppression. Um, and with that comes a, um, a challenge to this, this idea of like white womanhood as the universal um, experience. And that's really, really important. Um, and that's really important as a, in terms of like the theory and understanding um, like where um, feminist theories come from, but also in terms of the practice of, um, of femi feminism and feminist campaigning. Um, and so you can see this, this conflict in the way in which, um, for example, when a lot of um, white feminists were, were fighting for the right to, um, to have greater access to contraception or, or abortion, and when that was really high on, um, on the white feminist agenda, at the same time, what you had was black um, black women in particular who were fighting um, for sterilization that were happening at the same time, um, or Asian women who were fighting um, the sexual assault that they received um, by immigration um, officials with um, virginity testing in Heathrow Airport, for example. Um, so you have so that's when you start to see some of the contradictions in. Um, in the movement. And there's a really seminal um, article by Hazel Carby that was written in 1982 um, called White Woman Listen um, that really challenges um, this idea of like whiteness as a as a given, as a central position in, in feminism and that really fleshes out um, um, a, a different way of approaching um, of approaching feminism from the perspective of black um, black feminists. Um, and really calling out the sort of like invisibility of black women in, in, in white women's theories. Um, and you have a lot of really interesting work coming out around that time um, with, for example, um, Heart of the Race coming out in 1985. Um, that's really, again, asking some really hard questions about the, the scope of um, feminism, saying, for example, what's the point of taking on male violence if you haven't dealt with state violence? So really um, opening up this frame of like what counts um, within feminist practice and feminist thought. Um, and there's a really, really rich literature, which you'll find in the resource list. Um, 
And so, and so in the late 70s and the early um, 80s, you really start to see the ascendance of um, autonomous black women's movements. And here I'm using the term black um, in a, a sort of like political blackness um, frame, which was very prevalent at the time, although I'm going to try and um, complicate that a little bit um, later on. Um, so black in the political sense, meaning um, all colonized um, people, so reflecting a specific form of um, politics. Um, and so in this context, you start to see um, white feminists being forced to take note of, um, of the context um, that they were in. So thinking about um, struggles against racism, um, but also thinking about the relationship between the British nation and um, decolonization and white women's entanglement with, um, with British imperialism. Um, and, and with that, in the 80s, you really have an explosion in terms of um, black women really writing um, about themselves um, and their politics and their experiences. Um, and so here are just a few examples of like some of these really seminal um, pieces of writing that came out um, around, around that time. Um, and just to give you a specific example, um, the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, um, OAD, which initially actually was the Organization of Women of um, African and African Descent, um, was co-founded in 1978 um, by a group of women, including um, Olive Morris, that I think was mentioned in another um, lecture, who was um, very involved in the British Black Panther uh, movement, um, and also Stella Dadzi, who was one of the authors of um, Heart of the Race. And it was the first um, black women's organization to operate at a national level. So it was an umbrella organization for um, loads of um, black women's organizations, so politically um, black. And what they were doing was really taking up um, issues of class, issues of race and gender um, all, all at once. Um, and so thinking specifically about the kinds of campaigns um, and the kinds of work that they were doing. Um, so there was a lot of work looking at um, healthcare because a lot of um, migrant women's experiences in healthcare was um, was a really hostile one. So, for example, um, trying to talk about sickle cell um, anemia, which had been completely invisibilized within the healthcare system, um, talking about childcare, talking about prisoners' rights, um, talking about abortion laws. I've already mentioned the forced sterilization of um, specifically, I think Caribbean um, women with the use of the drug Depo-Provera. Um, but also sin bins, which is what um, what was happening to uh, happening to a lot of children um, who were placed in um, ESNs, ed educationally subnormal schools. Um, so these were the kinds of like the the kind of focus of um, of the, the organisations that made um, OAD. Um, OAD also had its own um, newsletter forward, which you can also see in the background there in the slides. Um, they had their own day schools, um, they organized national conferences, and they had special um, project committees. And one of the things that's particularly, I think, interesting about OAD was um, not just what they were organizing around, um, but also the way in which they organized. So you really see some elements of prefigurative um, politics um, in the way in which um, their approach to political organization, so using, for example, um, rotational representation. So they had rotations in terms of um, the different leadership um, roles that existed and um, the different committees, um, but also the, the centrality of childcare, for example, or thinking about other forms of um, commitments that um, its members um, had. Within OAD, you had a lot of very different kinds of groups that had very different kinds of interests or different um, focus points. Um, and in some ways, that was um, one of the strengths of OAD. And of course, later it also became, um, if not a weakness, um, certainly something that actually brought um, quite unique challenges. Um, so within OAD, you had uh, members who actually rejected the term um, feminist, who saw feminism as something that actually represented um, a white um, ideology. Um, and then you had others who really, um, for whom like the term feminist was, um, was really important. Um, there were also different priorities. So for example, some of the groups um, involved in OAD would, um, would be very focused on some of the struggles, decolonizing struggles that were happening um, 
back home um, in on the African continent, um, in Asia, um, in the Caribbean, etc. Um, and you and that's also where you start to see um, differences in terms of like the the priority that was given over anti-racist struggles in um, in Britain with people trying to settle here and trying to improve um, the conditions in which they were living here, um, and others who were really focused on um, all the political work that was happening um, outside um, outside of Britain. Um, and of course, there were a number of conflict areas um, as well, in addition to this, this question of priorities. Um, one was um, the kind of the role of ethnic differences. Um, and I think that's um, that's an important question. It's something that's still um, that's still being explored today. So thinking about actually the, the differences within um, and the differences in terms of experiences, the differences in terms of um, language, the differences in terms of class as well and different forms of access. Um, and so that started to really um, create or exacerbate some conflicts. But also sexuality. Um, there's um, there's some really really interesting pieces um, in the resource um, list around the, the the struggle within OAD around sexuality and the role of um, black lesbians, for example, and whether or not they were accepted in the kind of and that was a big um, that was a really important site of um, of conflict as well. Um, but I think it's also important to think a little bit more um, widely about the histories of Black British feminism that are um, even still harder to find. Um, and there's a lot of really important work um, here. So, for example, um, Therese Johnson um, talks about um, the way in which feminist academia and feminist activism in Britain today um, continues to be um, white dominated and she talks about the reproduction of racism and whiteness within um, within British feminism um, and so she's looking at the kind of the dominant historical narratives that enables the reproduction of this specific understanding of feminism um, and I think that's something that's really important for us to keep in mind um, and this idea of the like British feminism being a story that belongs um, to white women um, so how do we begin to like really unpack um, unpack that? Um, Michelle Rolf um, Truyo, who was a um, Haitian um, anthropologist, um, has done a lot of really important work looking at what he calls the narrative production um, of history. And so he deals with the ways in which the production of historical narratives um, involves the what he calls the uneven contribution of competing groups and individuals who have unequal access to the means of, of the production of, um, of historical narratives. Um, and similarly, Hazel Carby, um, who we've already mentioned, talks about, um, she problematizes um, archives and the way in which archives can present history as a sort of consensus um, and often mask the actual conflicts um, that exist. Um, and Anne-Laura Stoller has some really interesting work that's looking at, again, looking at archives and looking at um, what she calls archival um, asides, um, which I find quite um, interesting. And so through engaging with that kind of literature and thinking about the histories that we may not have um, access to, I think it raises some really important questions around um, how we know what we know. Um, so just these kind of like methodological, but also um, epistemological challenges. And so because we had these kinds of questions, um, myself and um, Mumbi and Conde, um, we started working on a project called um, Unarchiving Black British Feminisms. Um, and as I said, we got some money from the Feminist Review Trust to start to actually ask some of these questions. What are some of the other groups that we don't have access to? Um, groups that were smaller than OAD, for example. Um, and what were their politics about and what we could learn from them? Um, and so the way that we went about it was, um, one, engaging with people we knew, people in our circles whose, um, whose parents, whose mothers or aunties um, were involved in some of these struggles. Um, and so through that, for example, one of our friends, um, Zinzi, was um, telling us about um, her family that was very involved in, in Manchester and in what was called the Manchester Black Women's Cooperative and then um, renamed itself as um, Abyssindi. Those are doing some really, really fascinating work um, in Manchester, including a lot of um, anti, like involved in like a lot of local anti-deportation um, struggles, for example. 
um, but also providing a wider support base for, for black women um, in Mossad specifically um, through a community resource center, through supplementary and cultural um, educational facilities for, for black children and young people, um, through a lot of different forms of solidarity work. Um, and so we only found out about Abyssindi through having these conversations with, um, with people in our lives. Um, and then another way in which we were able to like find some of these um, more marginal um, histories was by engaging um, with oral, um, oral history um, projects. So we went down to the Black Cultural Archives in, in Brixton um, and they have a, a really, really useful resource um, called the Heart of the Race um, Oral Histories where they recorded um, interviews with a lot of black feminists um, from, I think, the 70s through to the 90s. Um, and in there, um, I remember listening to one of the to one of the um, one of the recordings and someone, uh, a woman called Judith Lockhart talks about um, in passing, she talks about a woman called Mia who was involved in um, the East London Black Women's Organization. And so through there, um, we started to do some research, right, and see if we could find anything about this group, um, um, the East London Black Women's Association. Um, and then we were able to like speak to Sala Dadzi, who herself then put us in touch with um, with a woman called Ama, um, who was actually one of the co-founders of Albo. So we interviewed her and we tried to collect more, uh, more of that history. Um, and just a, a final example is the South Hall Black Women's Centre. Um, who we only came across in the sort of like in an, an accidental uh, manner by clo by close reading of um, footnotes in a book called Majority Minority Relations in Contemporary Women's Movements, um, and that footnote just revealed the existence of of this group um, by just saying in 1986 Afro Caribbean members of South Hall Black Sisters left to form the South Hall Black Women's Center. And so just this sort of like um, archival aside um, pointed to the existence of this um, other group that we just never heard about, never um, seen written about um, anywhere. And so through this um, project and trying to really unearth um, some of this work, um, we we became aware of like some of the wider, um, the wider lessons that we can learn from um, the Black British feminist um, movement. Um, and I think some of these lessons are around um, conflict and how conflict works um, and what were some of the causes of conflict. So, for example, Elbow um, left um, OAD or some of them say they were kicked out, um, partly to do with um, their refusal to not work with men. So OAD had some like, quite strict lines about the involvement um, of men. And a lot of women um, who were involved in Elbow actually really wanted to be able to have men in the room. Um, and so they had a specific way of organizing that meant that they had men in the room, but with no voting power, for example. So men could present, men could respond, um, but they couldn't they couldn't vote. Um, and so this idea of like specific political differences around how do we organize at the local level? How do we um, integrate ourselves in our wider community? Um, so it was very interesting to learn about these different approaches to um, to organize, organizing even within um, within these um, Black British feminist spaces. Um, another thing that I think is really crucial is thinking about the role of class differences and how class differences actually played out in in these organizing spaces, um, but also played out in the way in which um, like who actually had access to funding. Um, and through that, who was documented. So actually a lot of the small organizations that had primarily working class members um, tend to be, um, were less likely to be funded and less likely to be documented. And therefore we have less information um, about them. The groups that, ha that didn't really have anyone who then went on to go into academia um, are also less likely to leave um, a trace. Um, another thing was also just thinking um, more specifically about the role of sexism in um, in the wider um, black power movement, um, because actually a lot of the groups that um, were involved in OAD and a lot of the black um, black feminist groups generally um, had very complicated relationships with the rest um, of the movement. And by complicated, I don't mean that um, 
purely antagonistic. Um, actually, sometimes there was um, cooperation, but I think um, it is really important to understand the some of the realities around um, the, the flaws of that movement. Um, and I think more generally, I think it's important to think about the, the legacy um, and what we can learn from, um, from Black British feminism. Um, and I think that um, thinking about the politics and thinking about the theoretical frames that are available to us um, today. So all of the work of um, individual um, organizers and academics, um, people like Olive Morris, who's, um, who's been mentioned um, previously, people like Claudia Jones, um, whom I haven't mentioned today, but I would really recommend um, looking at um, her role in, um, in the movement, but also her role in terms of um, putting together some really, really crucial um, frames and theories um, through which to think about the relationship between race, class and gender, for example. Um, but I think the legacy is also in terms of our ability to think about um, our relationship to the state and our relationship to one another. Um, the politicization of difference, but also the weaponization um, of difference within resistance movements, but also um, from outside of that, so from the state, um, from the far right, um, etc. And thinking about um, how these different groups were able to build um, solidarity and how sometimes this was um, complicated. Um, so looking at, for example, when OAD um, folded, the causes um, of that, but also what we can learn um, from that. And I think we are lucky to have access to um, to resources that are able to like really um, think through some of these complicated questions. Um, so I haven't given a definitive history of um, Black British feminism. I think that there's still a lot that is actually quite beyond um, our reach. And I think that's why it's important to keep having um, different methods and different ways of trying to, um, to gather um, um, information. So through oral history projects, through engaging with um, archives, etc. cetera. Um, so this was more of a, a glimpse into um, some of the history that we have access to. Um, but I think if you want more specifics about who was doing what and where, um, the reading list will provide you with um, loads um, loads more resources. Um, and as you explore those resources, I would really encourage you to try and think about, well, first focus on the ones that speak to you, but then let um, let your reading of these texts be guided by um, by questions around um, the, method, the methods um, used. So thinking about the formats that we have access to. So if you're able to find some of these old newsletters, um, look at whose voices are centered, what issues are being discussed, um, etc. And I will leave it at that. Thank you.